We have two uh, extraordinary American whistleblowers from the NSA. Uh, we have Anna Grafolter, who's going to discuss uh, a German whistleblowing case of some importance and which we should know about. Holger Stark, who is the Der Spiegel's Washington bureau chief, is going to discuss both what happened to him and, and to others in the reporting that they've done. And Duncan Campbell, who's one of the world's leading freelance investigative reporters, who uniquely broke the Echelon story, spying story in the 70s, and is now involved in a significant parliamentary investigation in Britain. So with that, I think we, we can start almost immediately, because we have so many uh, speakers. And I think we'll start, probably, um, with Thomas Drake. When I woke up this morning, I once again was reminded, as I have been in the last several years going across the world, speaking at conferences and symposiums like this, I once again noticed the privacy lock on the inside of my hotel room door. Now this is a rhetorical question, why do we have keys or locks in our lives? Hey, if we have nothing to hide, right? Don't need any of that stuff. You see, information is a coin of the realm. But unfortunately, in a surveillance society, in a surveillance age, it's also used to atomize our lives. Even to the point of reducing us to mere subjects of state and corporate powers. But I also must admit, given where we're located, and given my own past from the latter years of the Cold War, staying in this part of Berlin because for me, there's still the shadow of what resonates in terms of what this used to be, East Berlin. And I must admit, yesterday, when I arrived at the hotel, I did kind of look over my shoulder, <laughs> just in case. In previous trips, I've also come to the eastern part of Berlin and visited the Stasi headquarters, the Stasi archives and the Stasi museum, plus the, one of the former prisons. And during my trip to the prison in particular, but as well as the Stasi archives, my own post-traumatic stress syndrome manifested itself. Because I recognized given my own past and then what I saw at the archives and at the prison, the former prison, what does it mean to have a surveillance state? See, this is the golden age of surveillance. And it's become a huge profit center for cyber-centric businesses. It is the panopticon of power. And national security services, first order of business, is being data collector hoarders of choice. And we are all data generators. What I want to share with you is a few comments, some perspective on this, given what I experience at the hands of my own government and given my own history in terms of the Cold War, we are truly seeing the de-evolution of democracy, a huge challenge, being largely held hostage or increasingly held hostage by secret powers of state, very susceptible to dark autocratic tendencies. So the question I want to pose right up front is what would you give up to protect your freedom? What would you give up to protect your liberty? What would you give up to protect your privacy? What would you give up to protect the very inalienable rights that we all have as people no matter where we live? 
These are sovereign rights that ostensibly no one can take away. Absent force, coercion, or done so without your consent. I'm reminded of a, st a statement attributed to Benjamin Franklin in United States history and lore. The democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. That liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote. How do we arm ourselves against those who would forsake our sovereignty for the sake of authority and the state under what I now call without equivocation the religion of national security? See, truth is treason in the empire of lies to channel Orwell. And I wear this cue on my lapel. That cue is not cue from Star Trek. <laughs> it's not quo vadis. It means question everything, especially authority. And if the cornerstone of liberty that is extremely well represented in this room is freedom of speech, what happens to your freedom when speaking truth to and of power and abuse of power as criminalized as a direct threat to the state. See, I've already lived a hyper-personalized surveillance regime that was imposed on me, characterized by extreme privacy and the dystopia of a police state persecuting and prosecuting me over many, many years. And yet, I took an oath in the United States to protect and defend, support and defend in particular the Constitution, a piece of paper and how to govern ourselves. And last time I checked, there is a Constitution in Germany. Piece of paper. And then 9-11 happened. I had taken the oath for the fourth time as a senior executive. And what I was exposed to was Pandora's box. I, I was an eyewitness to the subversion of that constitution. I saw raw executive authority being exercised with the approval of the White House. I saw the implementation of emergency powers, exceptional access, and what they would call in legal terms, exigent conditions. That we just need the data, Tom, when I confronted the lead attorney at NSA that first week in October of 2001 when I was informed in no uncertain terms that the White House had approved the program, now, no, now known more publicly as Stellar Wind, the President's surveillance program, but Stellar Wind at NSA. And it was all legal because the White House had approved it. I dared question authority and the narrative of power. And so I became a whistleblower, a dissident, a voice for the counter-narrative, upholding the rule of law, but then was flag-tagged targeted and tracked for doing so. For what? Calling out 9-11 intelligence failures, abuse of power, and in particular, mass surveillance imposed within the United States of America, including, and there are still people that don't believe me to this day, including surveillance on reporters and journalists on a far larger scale than took place back in the 60s and 70s. I experienced severe retaliation over four years, cooperated with major investigations, and yet to this day, no one can find the two 9-11 congressional investigations, to this day, no one can find any record of the thousands of pages of oral history taken, oral testimony, and documentation. All they can find to date is I was interviewed. So, not to be too facetious, if a whistleblower blows the whistle in a secret wilderness and no one in public is there to hear it, did they blow the whistle? <laughs> did they actually hear it? So, after many years of blowing the whistle in the wilderness, I made a fateful decision and I went to the press with what I knew. I became a high-value target as a result of the New York Times article, in which I was not a source, 
It was published in December 2005. In fact, such a high value target, along with others, so valuable a target that the FBI's elite mole hunter unit, which goes after real spies, went after me. And so I was unceremoniously raided in 2008. What I knew and had in my possession in terms of documentation, electronic gear and equipment, pretty much everything that was in my house was turned inside out and over and turned into the equivalent of contraband. Contraband used ostensibly in the commission of a crime. I was declared an enemy of the state. And after a couple of years of all of this, under criminal investigation, I just want to pause for a moment. When the chief prosecutor confronted me in a secret nondescript office building outside of DC with no windows, looked at me and said in no uncertain terms, Mr. Drake, how would you like to spend the rest of your life in prison unless you cooperate with our investigation? I was indicted two years later on the Espionage Act. That's why I was extraordinarily moved and disturbed by what I heard in one of the keynotes earlier today about Sedition Act being used to go after college students in India. I was the first whistleblower since Ellsberg charged in a similar manner. I knew I'd have to defend myself in the court of public opinion, but I didn't know how that would happen. And this is my one moment, again in public, to acknowledge as powerfully as I can the extraordinary defense of me by Jesselyn Radak, when no one else would defend me and no one else would be my voice in the court of public opinion, she did so. And yet the government said I was worse than a spy. Worse than a spy. It was actually stated before the court in the pretrial proceedings that what I did was worse than being a spy because if you were a spy giving up secrets, at least you give up the secrets in secret to a spy or another intelligence agency. What, what Mr. Drake, uh, this is the telling of the judge, he gave information that was in the, put in the press and published, which meant everybody gets to see it, including the spies. Was told I would have the blood of American soldiers on my hands for what I did. And more recently, and more chillingly, in many respects, the Joint Department of Justice and the DNI, the National Intelligence Directorate of the United States government, the Joint National Insider Threat Task Force, think about that phraseology, place me and Snowden on a rogues gallery hung up alongside mass killers and traditional spies in US history. Interestingly enough, the traditional spies had the flags of those countries in which they had given up secrets. Under the killers and under Snowden and myself, there were no flags. We were essentially declared stateless. And so I'm the only person to date associated with mass surveillance who was criminally investigated, secretly charged, prosecuted, indicted, convicted, and sentenced for the state crime of exposing secret state crimes, including mass surveillance. The right to keep and bear encryption and other means of digital protection in the digital age is critical to our sovereignty and our right to privacy. But I recognize the challenge. And so I'm going to leave you with this. Because it's getting easier, but often more difficult in many respects to remain anonymized and to actually use encrypted environments. What I'm about to say is probably going to make some of the journalists uncomfortable because, see, I have a real issue with certain journalists and media outlets. I have trust issues. Although they, in the end, were my saving grace, the number of journalists that I actually respect and trust in the entire world today, I can count on these two hands. Why? There are journalists, who I will not name at this time, who burned me 
as a source. Burned me. Who had collaborated as what I can only call informants with the government. Except for those of you who have seen the movie Divergent. Has anybody seen Divergent or Insurgent? It's the trilogy. It's quite a series. It's turning into three movies. Allegiance coming out soon. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes. I'll leave you a couple of quotes. The future belongs to those who know where to belong. And in Divergent, if you don't fit into a category, they can't control you, which means authority wants to control you. See, the real weapon of power in the information age is agency of control over information and communications. But you should know the real weapon of protection against that same power in the information age is the agency of disclosure over information and communication and exposing those powers. We must protect. Journalists and reporters and media must protect the very sources of the information you use to expose those things that are in the public interest. You must protect those who risk their careers. You must protect those who are convicted by the truth and exercise their conscience. And it's why I've dedicated the rest of my life to defending life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> yeah, William Benny. All right. Thanks. Uh, well, I think Tom's given the uh, the experience of uh, what whistleblowers uh, go through when they try to blow the whistle. I. Uh, I, of course, have taken a different tact. I've decided that sunlight is the cure here, and that means I have to expose everything they're doing in the public. So, and Edward Snowden was a great asset to me because he brought out documentation of all the programs basically I designed for them. So, and it makes me understand that their technology in, in terms of understanding data, they're really great at collecting it, but they can't understand what they've collected. Uh, and their technology in the understanding area has gone nowhere. They have done nothing to what I left them in 2001. So <clears throat> I have uh, changed my tactic instead of just exposing all the collection and their lack of understanding. <laughs> uh, I've decided to approach it from the consequences of their decision to do bulk acquisition on everybody in the planet. And uh, the basic consequences are, are very simple. People die, and then they focus on the attackers, and then they go after those who are associated. And in spite of that, if you look back through the last 15 years, and even before that, every attack that we've ever had, they always knew beforehand who they, that the people who committed those attacks were, were terrorists or associated with one group or another that was going to commit a crime or some kind of a terror act. Uh, they've always known them. Uh, <clears throat> so you have to ask yourself, well, if you knew them, why didn't you stop them? Well, the reason is because even before the bulk acquisition using Naris and variant devices where they can take entire 10 gigabit lines in, they were working two megabit lines in the 1990s. Um, and <clears throat> that's the reason we did thin thread because just with those two megabit lines, they were buried in data and couldn't figure out anything. So that was the major issue even back then. So we did ThinThread, which was to do a focused, targeted approach, looking at uh, massive amounts of data. Uh, we started out with saying 20 terabytes, terabytes a minute would be enough to start with. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, recognizing in that what was important to pull out that was relevant to all the targets we wanted to analyze, like terrorism or dope smuggling or weapons smuggling or any of the criminal activity internationally. So <clears throat> that, that gave, would give our uh, analysts a rich environment to actually succeed. Uh, and that's where we focused that. But unfortunately, that didn't cost a lot of money. So we lost the battle on that one because of money. They wanted to do multi-billion dollar programs, and that's really the focus that they had to get more money. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, Alexander, when he was here uh, over in Europe in Menwith Hill Station, said that uh, we want to collect it all. Well. Collecting it all means uh, they're committing the U.S. government and uh, the pub public, as well as, uh, since the GCHQ has adopted, that they're committed to, as well as the other five eyes and some other countries here in Europe, 
uh, to collecting everything, <clears throat> that's an ever-increasing problem every year. Uh, I mean, communications are exploding. So that means they're committing everybody to paying more to them to do that job. So their budgets are always going up higher, you know, year after year. So their empires are always being built. But in the meantime, <clears throat> that's for collection of data, but they haven't done anything for understanding. So they can't give warning. Understanding is where you get the warning of impending attacks, and that's how you alert people to stop, stop people from getting killed. That means your analysts have to understand what the, what the data means. And right now, they don't, and they haven't for a very long time because of this bulk data approach. That's why we did the targeted approach uh, <clears throat> for thin thread in the 1990s. Um, and they rejected that because it didn't give them enough money. So my attack now is on the consequences of their action. And it means not only do we pay for everything they're doing, but we have to die as a consequence. That's the real problem. I mean, they don't focus until people are killed. Then they look at video or whatever and they find who did it and then they focus in on all the data they've got from the bulk on those people that they already knew, by the way, uh, and then they go after everybody associated. <clears throat> that's what they did in Paris, that's what they did looking at the people in Boston. And, I, and, and at the, as the example I use all the time is the Garland, Texas attack. Garland police were tipped off two days in advance that that attack was going to happen. That was done by an, a member of Anonymous. Why did that anonymous person know and our entire intelligence community did not? Because our intelligence community was doing bulk. Anonymous, the anonymous person saw in the social network some people talking about doing a, uh, some kind of violent act and focused on them. And when they, when they gave up what they were going to do, that person knew and tipped off the police. That's what our intelligence agencies should be doing. It's called a professional disciplined job when you focus on the targets that are really doing bad things instead of the bulk acquisition of everybody on the planet. That's killing the entire process. So <clears throat> as a part of this, you know, I've gone to any number of uh, reporters and so on internally in, uh, in the U.S. Um, I found reception in some of them. Uh, Jane Mayer did an article. Jim Bamford did one. Jim uh, Risen did one. Uh, but by and large, the entire investigative or journalistic community in the United States, including the mainstream media and video and so on, are not touching this subject. They're too afraid to go into national security. Uh, that's because things like Jim Risen was under threat of uh, grand jury investigation for several years. Jim Rose and the AP were targeted by the FBI. So uh, the government is basically going around threatening people uh, to, uh, in, in, in journalism, even though they're protected under the First Amendment for, for a free press. They're being threatened uh, directly by the government if they, to stay away from these kinds of subjects. Well, that means you're not performing the investigative journalist sub a, a, a job anywhere in the United States. I mean, that's their job to tell us what the government is doing on our behalf. That's what they should be doing. Um, and they should address these problems. And they shouldn't be afraid because the First Amendment does protect them. And if they can find whistleblowers and leverage the data they can get from whistleblowers, they should do that, but they're not. So investigative journalism is basically dead in the United States. That's a real problem because we have no way now of getting to know what our government's really doing outside of whistleblowers. And that's not, that's not conforming to, the, to our constitution or any of the rights that we have as citizens or that the rights that people in the world have. And it's also killing us because that the, the, the way they're proceeding is making it impossible for them to succeed. So they can't stop the killers before they actually attack. So all this is, is, is just a dysfunctional, all generated by the need for money. That was the underlying principle here, what made them do what they are doing now. And they're, they're making sure that disinformation and misinformation is spread around, that nobody and any of the mainstream media, all they do is pick on the bobbleheads from the government to come out and re regurgitate all the things they've been saying all along, like, yes, it's legal, yes, it's legal, yes, it's legal, until it goes to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and gets out in the open where it's declared illegal, right? Well, that's because that, I, and I pointed out in my debate in the CPDP with uh, uh, Bob Litt, who was the, gen the attorney for the uh, Director of National Intelligence, I said that's the reason that it was a secret interpretation of Section 250 in the Patriot Act, that all that bulk acquisition of of, uh, 
uh, business records, <clears throat> and all of that was illegal, and the reason it was secret is because they knew it was illegal. So they are subverting our constitutional rights, and in, when I was debating Bob Dietz on, uh, on Al Jazeera, I called that him and everybody else, in my opinion, were committing treason against the founding principles of the United States. He had no retort to that. None. They had no legal response to it. Bob Litt had one, none either, yet the CPDP. They have not put the video out on that. I, I'm, I've been asking them to do that so that everybody can see what that, that confrontation was all about. But sunlight is the answer, and in order to get sunlight, we need investigative journalism to do it. They have to come out and take, and take a stand. I mean, if they don't, the public doesn't get informed, and they go, go along misinformed and uninformed, and they simply act like sheep being, uh, being led by the person with the bell at the, in, the, in, in the White House or at the heads of agencies and so on. Actually, the agencies have more power over the governments that, than uh, people really realize. Because even yesterday, I read an article where, in the Washington Post, where uh, now they're saying that uh, they are going to uh, routinely use NSA collected data in, in the courts for prosecuting people in the United States. Well, based on our laws and our constitution, that's not admissible data because it wasn't acquired with a warrant. But they are arrogantly coming out and saying, we're going to do this now. What do, you, what do you think you can do about it? They have more control over our government than anybody really realizes, and that's true of yours governments too. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> well, can you fancy going next? Hmm? Okay, that's fine. Anna Gret, go ahead. <laughs> this will be a, a, a different tact on what we've done up to now. Yep, okay, <clears throat> all right. Go ahead. Yes, indeed. I'm going to speak about whistleblower protection in Germany. And I'll present the Heinisch case, uh, Heinisch versus Germany of 2011. And what can be learned from it? Um, we have, uh, this is very different uh, from what you have heard. Those were extraordinary and exceptional cases dangerous cases. Uh, I must say we don't have such cases in Germany. We had one 50 years ago and we had a little, a little Netzpolitik org thing going on um, a couple of weeks ago, but uh, nothing, nothing uh, that uh, uh, amounts to that, uh, to that uh, uh, frightening, frightening conditions uh, we have heard of. So uh, I'm going to present an everyday case that can happen to all of us every day, and uh, I would mention a few things that all of us can do uh, and uh, to help against uh, secrecy, to counteract secrecy. Uh, there is no whistleblower protection law in Germany. Uh, there uh, is not, I mean, in Germany, the word whistleblowing wasn't even known 10 years ago. Uh, there is not going to be one in the foreseeable future. There were five draft laws, um, and uh, they were all rejected by the parliament, uh, by the uh, one or the other coalition, mostly uh, by those who were in power. Uh, labor law jurisdiction uh, is setting their own values. Jurisdiction on whistleblower uh, cases is deplorable in Germany. And that will be demonstrated by the Heinisch case too. Uh, their judges speak out against a law. I mean, no wonder they like to do their own thing. And um, uh, so let's not stare at the law. Uh, but think of other ways uh, to better protect whistleblowers. The Heinisch case, uh, which I'm going to uh, present now, is, a sentence, uh, is the sentence of the European Court of Human Rights and is a landmark judgment in favor of whistleblowing, freedom of speech, and the public interest. I will read this here because 
otherwise it will take it would take too much time. Brigitte Heinisch was employed as a geriatric nurse by Vivantes Netzwerk für Gesundheit, GmbH, a company specializing in healthcare and assistance to the elderly, which is majority owned by the Berlin Land, which means it's privately, from the legal point of view, it's a private GmbH, and so it's a, 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 a joint venture, a private, public-private uh, uh, partnership, and that is one of the major dangers to get information from public authorities because they can always refer to, uh, to uh, uh, trade secrets uh, and denying to hand out any information. When she voiced concern about the horrendous situations some residents were forced to endure, left to lie in their own excrement all day, sig significant personal shortages, a, p a policy of minimum hygiene, um, her, employer, her employer took no action. Instead, Vivantes made Heinisch's life miserable and a bullying culture was encouraged amongst fellow employees. The result has been a serious decline in Heinisch's health. Brigitte Heinisch finally made the moral decision to publicly accuse Vivantes of fraud and malpractice, forcing the subject of unacceptable living conditions in care homes, for the elderly especially, into the public domain. In 2005, uh, Ms. Heinisch was dismissed and challenged uh, her dismissal without notice before the Labour Court and won. The judgment was quashed by the Labour Court of Appeal in 2006, holding the dismissal had been lawful. The decision was upheld, that decision was upheld by the Federal Labour Court and the Federal Constitutional Court refused to admit Ms. Heinisch's constitutional complaint. Before the European Court of uh, Human Rights, finally, uh, uh, Brigitte Heinisch then complained that her dismissal and the court's refusal to order her reinstatement violated Article 10 uh, of the European Convention, and that's um, the right, uh, uh, the freedom of expression and information, uh, which is important. Uh, and there she has won after a fight of six years. The European uh, Human Rights Court found that the public interest now that is important, that the public interest in being informed about shortcomings in the provision of institutional care for the elderly by a state-owned company was so important, um, in, so important in a democratic society that it outweighed the interest in protecting the latter's business reputation and interest that the sanction imposed on Ms. Heinisch could also have had a serious chilling effect on other employees of the company and could have discouraged them from reporting any shortcomings in institutional care. In view of the media coverage, the sanctions could even have had a chilling effect on other employees in the nursing, uh, nursing service sector, which worked to the detriment of society as a whole. The court held that Germany was to pay uh, Heinisch 15,000 euros and then she, after that she got a, a compensation from her. Uh, she uh, uh, settled with her company and she got a compensation from them. So uh, the point I would want to make here is um, uh, it brings me to the very concrete answer to what uh, we can all do against secrecy in the context of whistleblowing. In every case, when a whistleblower is sanctioned, we, the civil society, activists, journalists, bloggers, anti-corruption campaigners, have to delegitimize delegit delegit the secret at issue and to show in a framework of human rights why going public was for the public good show the benefits of the revelation and the public's rights to know what otherwise we would not know. And, uh, uh, well, so uh, I ask you all, keep analyzing and utilizing the loads of, like, WikiLeaks revelations 
uh, there are still treasures, I'm sure there are still treasures to raise from the Manning documents and also show the tremendous, uh, and, and that's something that bloggers and journalists still can do, and, and the, of course the Snowden documents, they can go on and on, and I'm sure there are secrets to reveal which we all need to know. And uh, also show the tremendous contradictions of classification criteria. Uh, remember Hillary Clinton's 22 emails uh, on her private server, which were classified, uh, which were said to be classified top secret, and uh, the Secretary of, S of State herself said, well, there's nothing to classify about, there are no secrets. So uh, let us keep, uh, and, and let us keep changing what has been revealed uh, as illegal. Let's just go on doing something against what Snowden revealed, and let's also try to do it here. Um, so that is, to, from my point of view, that is an everyday uh, way to delegitimize secrecy. And I have a, a final, uh, a very uh, concrete suggestion to make. Um, so far, no visible consequences of the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights uh, for the German jurisdiction can be uh, seen. So what I would want to suggest is a fund for whistleblowers here in Germany with, or in Europe uh, with suitable cases who are willing to go all the way again for many years. The Heinisch case was six years. Appealing to all levels of jurisdiction to finally win before the European Court of Human Rights so that Germany and their whistleblower jurisdiction gets a slap in the face again and again, until they abide to the human rights with or without a law. <coughs> Duncan. So. Moment to plug in the slides, hopefully. I have it on the display. It's there, fantastic. Um, thank you very much, uh, Gavin. Um, I, as we wait here to enjoy the presentation from Mr. Snowden in Moscow tomorrow. I think it's really important to pay respect, extraordinary respect to these two guys, very much more senior in terms of years and experience and the things they had to weigh before they took their principal decisions to walk because of illegal and unconstitutional activity. These are the forebears before you. You're extraordinarily privileged to hear them. These are the people. These are the people who showed the way to Edward and helped us be informed. In this context, at this time, I wanted to actually look at where we've got in three years based on these exposures. And I'm sorry, it's not a, actually a pretty picture, despite the courage of all three and many others involved in this exercise. Um, my own story, parenthetically, is that more than 30 years ago, I faced 30 years in prison myself under espionage statutes for bringing to light in Britain the existence of our electronic intelligence agency, which is called GCHQ. And I want to share with you in particular where Snowden's disclosures have taken GCHQ and its implications especially for Europe and journalists, and they're not pretty. Um, I also had hoped in this context that we would have time to explore the quite intricate themes of Bill's important work. Bill is a spy, Tom was a spy. They led the spying activities of NSA, but they brought principle to it which was thrown out 15, 16 years ago. And it is interesting, and it will be interesting on a future occasion to look at 
Bill's FinFed program compared to the mass surveillance. And there were some clues that Germany may at one stage have handled things a little differently. So we may come to that. But uh, for those of us in Britain, in consequence, for everyone in Europe and indeed the rest of the world, we're at a terrible moment in British history. In days from now, the decisive vote of the British Parliament on a proposed new law, the Investigatory Powers Act of 2016, is due to take place. We are fighting like dervishes to try and constrain this, but we do so in the face of a conservative majority in our parliament, which has decided, all right, you've had your conversations, you've had your disclosures, and now we are going to cement into our laws and principles uh, that which we have done for years and which Snowden told you about. Okay, we've admitted it, and now we're going to carry on, but we're going to get bigger and larger and more powerful. And oh, by the way, we are not listening. And especially, we are not listening to the lawyers and the judgments of the European Court and the European Convention and the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the things that we all, our different nations, fought over and divided over 50 years ago are to be forgotten in months if the British government gets its way. In the campaigning now, in Britain it's called the Snoopers Charter, and uh, its provisions are extraordinary. They launched the revised edition on this literally eight days ago, 300 pages of legislation, 900 pages of supporting documents. I don't know a single person in politics or support who's had the time to read it all but MPs for the government party will be whipped to vote for this, lined up, and that's going to happen by coincidence next Tuesday. And just to help things along, the British budget, which is always an important news item, is the next day. This is what we face, and the we is bigger than Britain, because you and your countries and your institutions are and will continue to be the targets. This is what they now propose to legalize, stuff that they never admitted before Edward Snowden. They've gone into a new phase. After the first shocks and the anger of what Edward did, they said, okay, we have to admit this. We are doing bulk interception, bulk acquisition. They even told us, although we didn't know as journalists, that they were soaking up every database they could get, joining them together and every person in the country and internationally. We're going to have bulk personal data sets. And then we come to bulk equipment interference. Now, I'm not even talking about targeted stuff here. Targeted stuff can fit with some things that we all approve of. But they are legitimating, consolidating, and enabling everything. And bulk equipment interference, in case you don't get it, and most of you should, it means hacking. Systematic armies of computers attacking armies of computers to bring them down, plant malware, or just get hold of bots, which could be your computer if you're unguarded, so that a British or American, Australian, Canadian spy can use it to cover their tracks and spying and maybe implicate you to launch cyber attacks, well, the DDoS. All of that is about to be enabled, and there's more. British companies are about to be compelled, if this law passes, to create a new records on the browsing activities, not just on web pages, because that's that they've had for a bit. They want to go into the specifics of each application. They want to reduce the complexity and nuancing of the internet to a telephone exchange system. They think it's like that, according to the government. And internet companies are going to face these. The government doesn't have the faintest idea what they actually want to do, how much it will cost, how many records will create. They have no basis to measure intrusion. Yes, of course, we can all understand that on some occasions, when bad people use Facebook or WhatsApp uh, or Apple Talk, of course they would like to have it. There's a lot of stuff they'd like to have. They would like to have cameras in the bedrooms and offices of the plotters too, and if you wanted, you could have, as perhaps they would have been delighted to have here, cameras in every room, so the state and the Stasi could have kept watch. Let us pay tribute to Mr. Honecker who once stood here, but we're not going there. But in Britain, we are. National security notices will be served where they wish, in any terms they wish. And you'll go to jail for two years if you even talk about it. Technical capability notices on our communications companies. And they have even taken the chutzpah to take the power to say they can serve it on anybody overseas. Of course, they can't enforce it where British laws don't run, 
But if you're a German corporation, or a Dutch corporation with offices in Britain, and they can hit or punish an executive you located there, you'd better clear out of Britain pretty quick if they want the data you've got. They are pleased to call what they're about to bring in a world-leading capability. And what they mean is a little bit of tinkering with the judicial process in improving certain warrants. I think we should give them the term of world-leading. But it is world-leading, and I think this is a term that I've heard Tom used before. It's world-leading in, in the sense that the people who once stood here would applaud it. It's the Stasi on steroids. Well done, David Cameron and Theresa May. And just in case you didn't think they were already affecting you, how many people in the audience know where this is a picture of? Good. It's the British Embassy, not very far from here. And that little circular thing is the British spying apparatus built to spy on the center of Berlin. Its code name in the British apparatus, this hasn't come out from Snowden yet, but it's Trist. And you can see on that reconstruction from Google Earth that they've stuck it above the block, just above the Adlon Hotel, so that it's in line of sight of the Bundestag, the Chancellery, and most of the important places in central Berlin. This was also revealed uh, just after Spiegel did the story which I was glad to help them with on this little place, which is on the American Embassy, just uh, by the Brandenburger Gate. That's the NSA spying box, the special collection service. Again, beautifully positioned, if you line it up, to have electronic targeting and beams directed straight into the Bundestag. So the targeting of Chancellor Merkel was just the tip of the iceberg. Britain's activities are huge, and they will carry on, and they will be enlarged, including powers to hack, powers to take all the data, powers to acquire data states. That's the story that Spiegel did. Uh, when bringing out the story in the Americans. One of the remarkable things was the next day after we looked at this, um, Andy muller Magoon, who's probably in the audience here, had arranged for some infrared images, and we noticed that the heated buildings, the heated up space up there, was actually turned off on the evening that the Chancellor met with President Obama. Then Germany plays another role in helping it all along. These are the lists of third-party collaborators, a Snowden document. Every state in the European Union is on it except Ireland. <laughs> we are collaborators. Our governments are collaborators, and they are not listening. The center of the hall of the distribution of this is, I am told, in Wiesbaden, where all of the other intercepted communications are gathered together and piped over to the United States and maybe shared with Britain. So that's the scale of where we've got. They haven't been listening, we've told them, Snowden has told them, and yet they are proposing only to consolidate and to make it worse. I put up these couple of documents to, again, as a show of further respect, to take you back to the time before 2001, when NSA, and the people are here with us, were working out how to go into the internet. They looked at this stuff, they set out the plans, and then they were to see that their technologies and activities subverted to throw the whole thing inward on the United States people, but also to extend massive global surveillance. These types of activities have been used to attack European companies by GCHQ and by the NSA. The um, Belgicom case in Belgium, the stealing of the SIM card codes from Jamalco in the Netherlands, the attacks on German satellite providers, all of that was hacking, organized by the British in conjunction with the Americans. Our government stands poised to authorize it, to authorize it on an ever more massive and unconstrained scale. In the face of this, and in the current debates in Britain, the extraordinary thing is that the legislation is clear. The jurisprudence is, is clear and ever clearer. For those of you who are the lawyers who touch on the law, it is the cases of Digital Rights Ireland, of Max Schrems, the Austrian activist, and in Russia, of Sakharov, another activist who has won a decisive result against the Russian SORM system of surveillance, which is exactly the same kind of system that the British government now put, seeks to put in. As we speak, people in Britain are rushing to see if they can get the implications of these judgments into the 
largely thick heads of our politicians to see in time you cannot legislate to pass an unlawful law. But there'll be the moves around about it. And in the meantime, <laughs> I say just with as much contempt of lawyers as has been expect, expressed here earlier and by Tom, and I don't, I don't stand apart from the criticism of journalism because I am so fed up of so many of them. Um, but uh, when I faced 30 years imprisonment, I had a lawyer who was a distinguished jurisprudent at the time who helped defend me and keep me out of jail from prison. His latest most distinguished activity, and I've quoted it from there, is to write an opinion for Facebook on the issues brought up by the Schrems case in Austria, which basically said uh, that uh, Safe Harbor, the American system where you, whereby it was just all right to send all European data to the United States, and now we know, thanks to Snowden, it was all being soaked up. Um, uh, Mr. Robertson wrote this judgment, he's saying, in my judgment, given the weakness of European legal protection against national security surveillance, the growing acceptance by governments in the UK and France in particular, the bulk collection of data is necessary, then really it's all right for Facebook to carry on doing what it's doing on the basis that European law is in reality, governments are behaving so badly that they're right down at the American standard, and therefore the comparability test, the essentially equivalent is the word that it matters in the judgment, we are actually as bad as they are. So at this point, I wanted to irritate our two distinguished guests, potentially, by bringing in their best friend, General Hayden. <laughs> a, quick, a quick boo for General Hayden, I think. Boo. <laughs> um, and General Hayden, um, who was the nemesis of the, 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 the project that they, they, and the, the courage that they showed, um, has just written yesterday, um, you can actually find it in the UK Guardian, to express his pleasure at this kind of thing, that the Europeans are, as in view, essentially hypocrites who are letting all this sort of stuff happen and pretending that they're really concerned. So three years on from the courageous activities of Edward Snowden, sadly little has happened. The Guardian and others who led this have gone away, the media, as we've said been earlier, are not really listening, not really caring. Um, governments are able to manipulate electorates and legislatures, as happened in the United States and is happening with us now. And the result is, <sighs> we get back to where we were before, unless, there are new and more powerful voices and new concerns. The only hope, it seems, is the law, but what we're certainly seeing in Britain is the government isn't interested in hearing from lawyers either. Thank you very much. Thanks, Duncan. <clears throat> Holger, feel free. Thank you very much, uh, Gavin, and uh, let me uh, use this opportunity as well to thank you for this uh, incredible conference and also um, Andy Müller-Magoon and uh, Michael Sontheimer. It's a really pl pleasure being here. Um, Duncan has mentioned uh, a very uh, prominent place in Berlin already, and when I arrived uh, in, the, in, in my hometown yesterday, I walked over, walked over the Pariser Platz uh, where Spiegel's office is as well. Um, this is uh, what you forgot to mention. Um, we're across of the American Embassy, and I stopped at the Pariser Platz and uh, had a look on this uh, facade of the Embassy building that uh, Duncan just uh, projected um, over there. And it gave me a bittersweet feeling, because uh, with the knowledge of what's being behind that facade and with the knowledge of having worked with the Snowden material since summer 2013, um, I was very well aware that there is a ton of um, surveillance equipment, the special collection service that Duncan mentioned, um, that enables um, all kinds of uh, surveillance, uh, phone call interception, especially in that radius in the core of Berlin. And it's not only the Americans, it's also the Russians who are just 100 meters away. The Brits are around the corner. Um, the French embassy, which is doing a lot of surveillance as well, is around. And right in the middle is Spiegel's office. And why, why is that a bittersweet um, feeling? Um, at that place, we worked in 2010 together with a group of other media outlets, WikiLeaks, New York Times, um, The Guardian, and others. 
uh, with the uh, Manning documents, um, the, uh, the files that revealed uh, war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq and also a lot of diplomatic uh, issues uh, for the diplomatic cables. Um, and only now, after, after um, Snowden came up and the NSA affair evolved, um, we also learned that uh, in early 2011, so a couple of months after we've been working at that specific place uh, with the uh, WikiLeaks material, um, the CIA approached the German Chancellery and asked for a private meeting. Um, it, it, it was a secret uh, walk through the uh, Tiergarten, the, uh, the garden in the center of Berlin. Um, and during that walk, um, the CIA presented um, the fact that Spiegel was doing some research within the German government. Um, they called in um, the intelligence coordinator of the German Chancellery and asked for a meeting uh, in, in Langley at the CIA headquarters, which happened in June 2011. Um, the guy uh, who was, was leading the conversation was no other than the CIA's deputy director, Mike Morell, at the time. And they again pinpointed um, to several specific researchers that Spiegel has done in that period of time. And it was obvious that they obviously had intercepted um, Spiegel's research um, at that specific location at the Brandenburger, Brandenburger Place, right across of the American Embassy. And this is, this is a very concerning, very worrisome um, point because it goes to the roots of freedom of press. It comes to a, to, to, to a core point where press is really threatened, where you can't speak of a free democracy anymore if a, a media outlet is not longer able to, to conduct uh, research but must be aware that a foreign intelligence agency is tapping into its phone calls, is um, surveying uh, specific move movements or whatsoever, and then approaching a domestic government and pinpointing to specific contents, to specific researchers. It gets to the roots of having whistleblowers having sources, having free interaction between a news outlet and people who think they, they might provide information. And it also undermines the constitutional right that um, the German federal court has written down into one of those groundbreaking decisions um, earlier on in the late 2000 years. Um, the idea of whistleblowers or of people contacting a newsroom is nothing new for us. I mean, it has been, has been all over the place for decades. It is, if you want to say so, the gold standard of journalism, because in many places, in many stories, in many researches, it is almost impossible to find an inroad into a government, into a company, into a power place, without anybody from inside speaking to you. And there is only one golden rule for journalists dealing with whistleblowers, and that is protect your source by any means. Um, now, through the digital age and the digital revolution, um, there has been a lot of changes um, in, in the old relationship between newsrooms and whistleblowers. Some, some for the better. Julian Assange invented a decade ago this uh, revolutionary idea of submitting stuff and making it possible for whistleblowers to publish themselves things and submitting them to, to a platform like WikiLeaks um, securely via, via an online submission system. But it also came with a price, and, and that price is a high one, and it is changing uh, my profession uh, significantly. And that price is that if you must be aware that every kind of communication, every kind of interaction between a newsroom, a reporter, and, and, and a potential source um, can be monitored, can be surveyed, um, then it's getting really dangerous for, for, for freedom of press. Um, Tom has um, quoted um, the golden age of inf information surveillance. Um, that comes from an NSA document that we've been able to, to review during uh, the Snowden research and is from 20, 2010 and it describes um, the possibilities and um, the opportunities for intelligence agencies to connect dots and um, just to know who is talking to whom. Um, Keith Alexander, the, uh, the former uh, NSA director, made that clear in 20, uh, 2008 when he visited um, a GCHQ outpost in, in UK, when he asked, why can't we collect every information always everywhere? And this is, this is a haystack that we are talking about. And within those haystacks, there are certain needles. Some might be terrorist-related, but others are also research-related. And having the, those haystacks, having basically every kind of communication, it enables intelligence agencies to, um, to investigate not only who might commit a crime, but also a crime in, in, in the eyes of the government, which is uh, approaching a newsroom and coming up with a potential scandal. Which leads me to the conclusion, or to the, to the uh, thesis, that my profession has to change significantly. I think it's, it's almost irresponsible to um, act openly in many ways um, when it comes to communication with potential sources. 
Um, three years after the Snowden revelations, most of my colleagues still do not use Tor as an encrypted uh, web server. Most of my colleagues still do not use uh, PGP to encrypt emails. Most of my colleagues still do not use uh, um, iPhone apps like Signal, um, Redphone, or others. Um, do not use encrypted chats that allow you to at least hide a little bit of your traces. And I think when it, when, at least when it comes to the segment of investigative reporting, um, you have to make sure that um, you can guarantee a certain level of security when it comes to communication. Of course, you can meet privately, and that's still the utmost uh, secure way of communicating. You can meet the source um, under four eyes um, in, in a restaurant, in a, in a bar whatsoever, and then just talk privately. But on a day-to-day -day basis, digital communication is required. And not being able to offer that is, is I would say, shame for my profession. So at Spiegel, we've tried to, tried to um, innovate a lot of things, and we've, uh, we've, we've brought in uh, encrypted phones that enable us, us um, at least to talk uh, securely via Washington, for instance, the headquarters in Hamburg, our Berlin outlet. Um, we've set up a, a chat server. We offer a PGP um, a key for people who want to contact um, uh, the, the, the staff. Um, and I think we try to try at least to to keep pace with what um, the surveillance state is, is doing. And I think this is something that, that even three years after Snowden, not much of, um, of my colleagues have done, and that is a shame. And again, let me emphasize, number one golden rule, protect your source by all means. Thank you. <clears throat> Holger, what, could you describe what happened to yourself? Well, there, I think there's still, still some ground respect when it comes to the treatment of journalists. And, and honestly, um, working for Spiegel is a huge privilege in those terms because um, in 1960, in the early 60s, Spiegel has been raided um, and it was a huge scandal against, uh, between the government and, 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 and all media outlets. And finally, I think the media branch pretty, pretty convincing won that scandal. So touching Spiegel is, is is a red line you don't want to cross as a prosecutor. But for NSA or Free CIA, it was much easier. I mean, they, they do, do not oblige to German law. They can do it from overseas. The, German, the embassy is protected diplomatic ground. So there is nothing that can, can um, hinder them of, of attacking the media. And the German government, I, I, really, I really would have seen my government, the chancellery, when they became aware of that, um, mm. that case that they would have stepped up and, and complained and said, what, you're bre breaching German <coughs> privacy laws? It's, it's the G G10 article in the German for, uh, constitution which, um, uh, which has been, been, been broken at that time. Mm -hmm. But they, 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 they complied. I mean, it became like, 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 like two friends conspiring with each other. And there mm -hmm. was, they didn't choose the side of the freedom of press. And that's worrisome. I personally can't complain. I think um, working as a journalist for Spiegel gives you a lot of privilege. But the overall message has mm -hmm. been really worrisome. Right. Good. We can take some questions from the audience now and it's, um, amongst the panel themselves as well. Um, anybody has anything to contribute and say? Uh, hmm? Go ahead. I, I, Bill. I, I had something I wanted to mention about uh, the uh, current flap between the FBI and Apple. Uh, you know, the, 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 what they're really, uh, if you stop and look at it, what they're really after, and I think I know what they're really after, uh, they, they want Apple to uh, disconnect the, uh, the part of the software in their operating system that says if you try more than 10 bad, software, bad uh, passwords, I delete everything in the, in the phone. Or uh, the, other part, the other two parts they want to get rid of, one is that uh, you can only put the password test in at a certain rate. You just try one, and you have to wait a minute to try another. You know, the period of time you have to wait. And the uh, third thing they do, I think, is built into the software that the character inputs for each of the passwords being tested have to have variable rate input, meaning a human's typing it in and not a machine testing it. So that, that's the bulk attack on those phones. Well, if you pair that up with the theft of billions of SIM cards from the Netherlands, uh, what the SIM card does is that gives them uh, your identity and your access code through the network which means they can come down the network and brute force attack all the iPhones in the world with this new software testing all the passwords on all of them anywhere in the world. And then they can download your phone wherever you are. 
and you'll never know it. That's what they're really after. He has a question, please. Yeah. Good. Yeah, my name is Ronald Toten. I have one question. What was the reason for Der Spiegel to open an office directly in the neighborhood of the U.S. Embassy <laughs> and work there with the delicate documents in Snowden and so on? Well, this is not only the American Embassy there. It's uh, the, the Chancellery, it's the German Parliament, and uh, the Berlin office is mainly covering um, politics in Berlin. So uh, being close <coughs> to that place uh, is almost a necessity for us, a uh, necessity for, for every journalist. Um, that's also the reason why the American Embassy uh, so desperately <coughs> wanted to, to have, have, have that, uh, that, that place over there because they, they wanted that affiliation as well. And it's, uh, I think, um, honestly, the interception of journalist communication is only just a mi minority um, when it comes to the targeting. I think the overwhelming interest um, by the NSA at the time, or the American government at, as a total, was to to uh, intercept um, governmental communication. Um, but we can't go in a suburb and then drive for an hour and a half to a parliamentary meeting. Uh, we need to be able in, uh, to, to, to go back and forth and put a walking distance. Thank you, everybody, for uh, what you bring to, to the stage. The question we have been talking about German and American European context. Does anyone have any interesting information or any thoughts about how this plays in a global context? The uh, Shanghai Cooperation Council, Council of Europe, where these kind of macro multi state initiatives are trying to uh, you know, look into surveillance technologies. Um, do you have any tips for journalists that are operating in other parts of the world in which perhaps China is uh, a major supplier of? telecommunications infrastructure and how that affects on a, the techno side the threats of journalists um, and for freedom of expression as well. No comment? Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> the most important things to probably to look at, just to get us to are the reports of the uh, special rapporteur to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. Um, there was a very good report immediately after Snowden, and, and in fact the new rapporteur's report um, just came out, I think, yesterday or two days ago. It pretty much condemns Britain. In the regional fall of human rights and down to administrations like, like China, I mean, it becomes the usual lip service of diplomacy. Um, uh, every, everyone will gather together in the, the big chambers and, and, and uh, cluck away and make adverse remarks about their opponents. But few are the states who actually then get down to embedding specific protections for the porters or others who are especially vulnerable. Um, and I think the core harm in this is that everybody's at it. Everybody's doing it. I mean, German, German laws seem from the United Kingdom look very strong. They look far better than we've ever had, and it's obvious that in some respects that's because Britain shaped some of those laws in the face of um, uh, denazification, and that the new generation of Germans bringing in the experience of the Stasi have not unlearned in the way that the rest of Europe has learned. But, you know, the day after I exposed that thing on the top of the British embassy, a, a BND guy in our local embassy told me that they'd actually sent people round to the embassy, we'd have liked to have a look, and of course, they knew the answer. It's diplomatic premises, you can't come in. Um, the best the German government did was to um, slap the British government about the face in a manner I'm told has not happened since 1936, which is that the British ambassador was <coughs> summoned to the foreign ministry to be seen by a sort of junior secretary or something like that. That had not been done against Britain since 36. But um, the reality is, and if we had more time, I'm sure Tom and Bill could tell us a great deal more about it, um, is that the BND are up to the same games. They were in, in thick, they were <coughs> utterly committed. Bill has told us, how, um, could tell us how uh, they took the code from, from NSA to use. And the recent scandal, which is still being going on, hopefully you know about it, was um, about the targeting of European entities on the German systems because the NSA handed over the target lists and BND just did it. So everybody's as dirty as each other. 
And that's why you get top lawyers like the one I should, you know, saying, oh, Facebook, it's really all right to, to, to ask for safe harbor to be contained. Because Europe really stinks, they just won't admit it. And that's why General Hayden put up his two fingers and said, Hello. you guys are bad. Can we take a few more questions? Let's, let's take two or three, yeah? <coughs> this, is, this is all very sinister. When you take all the single cases you, you were reporting about, and of course we, we all are now terrified. I wonder, you, are, you have been sitting on so many panels around the globe actually, and I wonder if you could perhaps tell us at which point you actually caught the audience so that people had this spark in their eyes and said, okay, now I know what I should do um, to actually combat that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking for this trigger point and if you perhaps have some ideas or stories where you actually found people not to become so anxious and terrified, but actually have get this feeling of, yes, I can do something about it, and I, I, I join some kind of movement. Okay, okay. We take a few more questions before you respond. There's one over there. That's yeah, it. One, two. Okay. Actually, I would just like to ask about, okay, yeah. I'd like to ask about the role of actually money and basically the threat of a state when you are charged, for a newspaper, an individual, in any of the states we've talked about, or any of other states maybe, that the economic, like what it costs to defend yourself from charges of corruption, whether you're a newspaper or an individual, and what it costs in terms of time, resources, and money in order to challenge an unjust um, legal judgment. And that, because I think that would be fundamental, that's also, I think, a big threat to newspapers, is that how willing are they to take a risk and it, like take on a three or five year legal battle? And third question. Yeah, I have a question to the Spiegel journalist. You mentioned that you have uh, problems of surveillance. You fear to be taped by Secret Service, U.S. Secret Service, and you mentioned that uh, Spiegel has a big reputation. But unfortunately, that has changed since the 1960s. And in the meantime, we have we know that that Secret Service uh, agents were walking into the into the redaction of the Frankfurt Argument in Zeitung and writing articles there. And we have, we have read in Spiegel articles pointing out the point of view of Guantanamo <coughs> torturers and pointing out how useful that was for uh, detecting certain 9-11 secrets. So actually, how independent are you? Uh, have you never seen walking these guys out of your office and in your office? <coughs> Let's... Um, so, do you want to take one more, or then? No, I think we should de deal with these. There are a lot of questions here. <laughs> do you want to go? Shall I, shall I Feel start? Feel free. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, thank you for your, very much for your question. I think uh, you're coming from wrong facts, but um, w when, you, when you describe um, intelligence agencies walking into other newsrooms like the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, um, you, you shouldn't compare that to us. Um, it didn't happen. Uh, and we, I, I personally have been called in into several court cases and asked to re reveal sources and, and to, to testify, and I always refused um, <coughs> with, because a reporter is not, not a witness for security agencies in court. Um, I've been personally the one who revealed that um, there was a guy from Germany, um, Murat Konatz, uh, flew to Guantanamo and have been tortured there. Um, it was Spiegel to reveal that and it led to an investigation committee. So whatever you're claiming about Guantanamo, I don't know where your sources are from, it's definitely not Spiegel, um, because we always took the stand um, that uh, what, what is going on in Guantanamo, what is going on in the rendition program is a terrible case. We spent uh, weeks and months of investigating another German case who has been uh, uh, kidnapped by, by Americans and uh, brought via, uh, to a Syrian uh, prison, um, uh, Mohammed Haider Samar, um, who also led um, to, a, to an investigation committee. Um, so I think it's, uh, Spiegel's position on, on waterboarding, on, on rendition, on Guantanamo always has been clear. This, this um, is uh, totally unacceptable. <clears throat> I, I, on this particular question, I did want to provide a U.S. perspective because it was in my particular uh, 
criminal prosecution, the chief prosecutor actually threatened in the courtroom to bring in the reporter before the judge because the argument was being made, which actually happened in the Sterling, Jeffrey Sterling case with Risen, that the reporter was the only eyewitness to a crime. Therefore, we needed the reporter's testimony against the source to prove that there were a crime was committed. Now, my judge said, no, we're not going to go down that deep, dark hole, meaning he was not going to take on the First Amendment in his courtroom. However, in the Sterling case, they actually subpoenaed Risen three times, threatened uh, uh, to include threatening him with being placed in jail if he refused to testify ostensibly against one of his sources. I mean, that's, that's what's happening in the United States. Now, fortunately, he blinked at the last minute. But Sterling is now in prison for several years, all because of metadata. And remember what Hayden said about metadata. Metadata kills people. In this case, metadata, without any other evidence, was used to actually put a source, a real whistleblower, in prison. Yeah. That was the question about yeah. the money, and that was the question about the trigger. Mm -hmm. The role of money, which was your question. And there's a question about, from John Goetz, about yeah. what, how can you trigger people to, yeah, I, to be inspired? I, I, I think I can add something to that. I mean, uh, <laughs> I've had difficulty <laughs> conveying to people. I, I'm trying to explain the Snowden material because I think that people don't understand it. So I, I, I use it in, in different talks I give to try to explain to people what it really means and what's happening. Uh, some people, uh, mostly nerds, get it, you know? <laughs> uh, but a lot of people don't. They seem glassy. I, nobody really gets it. Um, and, and so that's why I uh, worked with the, I volunteered and certainly uh, w welcomed uh, Fritz Moser, an Austrian film director, to make a film about this. And uh, from, it, it's now in different film festivals, and from that reaction to the film, the film goes into the same kind of thing of how, what's going on and what it means, but in film it's a different, it's a visual, you know, where people can actually see things, and from that people are responding back saying they're getting it. And this is everybody, this is not just a few. So I think uh, the, the problem in, in these highly technical things, it's difficult to understand and begin with, unless you're in the field, I mean. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, going into other media, art or film, uh, where people can look at things visually and maybe get a better concept of what's happening, it, it gets the message across on, the, and from that they start to get clear in what's going on and understand it. Thank you. And uh, can anyone comment still on the role of money? Yeah, let, let, me, let me fill in on, on this position. There's a saying that in politics, um, if, you wanna, uh, if you seek a friend, buy a dog. Uh, in journalism, I would say, if you're, if you're looking for a friend, um, find a lawyer, um, a good lawyer. Um, and good lawyers are expensive because in most cases where you threaten <coughs> challenge power, as the title of the symposium is, um, you do it either with, with, with a big company or you do it with the government, but uh, usually you have a, a powerful enemy. Um, so you need a lawyer to be aside your reporting um, in, the, in the best case scenario to go with you through the facts and through the evidence um, before, before going public, but definitely also um, when, when the story is out. Um, and that costs money. And we are glad that uh, Spiegel has a whole team of legal experts who are going through every line which is, which is going to be published and before it's, it's published. And that we often have cases where we spend like, like six months or a year um, in court um, going back and forth, with, which costs a lot of money. And I think this is something that, that you need to be able to provide um, if you don't want to risk a lot. Bill? I, I had uh, two aspects on money. Uh, one was the effect on whistleblowers. Uh, uh, in, in, in my case, I didn't, uh, Tom's case was the extreme uh, because they continued to prosecute him. I mean, he should address his case. But in my case, I, I cut my losses at a little over $10,000 uh, uh, because I threatened them with counter prosecution. <laughs> That's the only way I stopped it because I was assembling evidence of their malicious at, attempt at prosecuting us. And it was very clear that I could prove that in court, and I made it very clear to them that I was going to do that. Uh, then after I did, gave that, uh, made that known to them, one month later I got a letter of immunity. That was going from being told by our, uh, a lawyer that we were going to be prosecuted to getting a letter of immunity in a month. Of course, after I told them that I had the goods on them. So by threatening them, 
You know, that was one way that stopped them from that, but that was the only thing that stopped them. Otherwise, they went to the extreme of Tom. And the, the other point about money is that's behind all of this, and there's a very large set of people involved in this, uh, not on Wall Street as well as uh, in industry and in the government. Uh, we knew from uh, staffers on the House Intelligence Committee uh, that companies were in government lobbying against our program because it was such a cheap, targeted approach. And they wanted this bulk acquisition system from money. So they were downtown uh, lobbying without us being present that our system wouldn't scale and all kinds of uh, false data like that. They were feeding people in Congress who didn't know very much anyway. They still don't. Uh, so uh, they were gullible and malleable and, very, and could be led around by a string by people they look at who seem to be technical and they think they know something and they don't. And so our Congress was led down that path and so the, the, any opposition from Congress to killing the program we had was basically killed that way. That's how they lobbied to get the real, bulk, the real money, which was tens of billions of dollars every year. It's not just the and golden then, age of surveillance. It's a yellow big road lined with massive amounts of money. Yeah. I remember after 9-11, uh, my supervisor was actually the number three person in NSA and head of the Signals Intelligence Directorate, going around the NSA campus, not only to console the workforce, but also explain what we were gonna do. And yet, during that, those interactions with the workforce, it was astonishing what I would actually hear come out of my own supervisor's mouth that 9-11 was a gift to NSA, we're gonna get all the money we want and then some. Yeah. A gift to NSA. So I remember about a year later, the 50th anniversary of the secret creation of NSA as a military intelligence agency in 1952, where a House Intelligence Committee staffer, one of the managers, was up on the dais with one of those big fake checks, <coughs> which had a number and nine zeros after it handing it to Hayden. And I still remember General Hayden up on stage looking down at George Tenet, the then the, the director of CI and the Central, the Central Intelligence, the DCI. You could see, I was all the way in the back, couldn't hear his words, but he's saying George. And he's pointing to George, then back to the check, and back to George. George, I got my money. I got my money. Now you tell me, I mean this a f extraordinary failure to, pr pr to protect people out of, you know, from harm's way, the intelligence failure of 9-11, and yet using that as the excuse to go back to Congress, and literally within just a couple of years, NSA budget was doubled, and then essentially grown even further beyond that. In my own case, the price was enormous. If you just talk about the financial costs alone, over a million dollars in lost income, legal fees, and other expenses, you're essentially bankrupted and broken. And yet, if you're the government, you essentially have unlimited funds. If the current example of the FBI versus Apple is any indication at all, they're willing to spend tremendous amounts of resources, huge teams of DOJ lawyers, to take on the incredible American success story called Apple. It's, it is a zero-sum game for them. And they're taking it into the court of public opinion. So money here, yeah, there's a lot of money at stake. I know many people yep. who compromised their <clears throat> principles when I was at NSA after 9-11 and said, geesh, even it was encouraged to form my own company and just you know, belly up to the bar because there's plenty of money to go around for everybody. Where you can hire five or six people and become a millionaire. <clears throat> and and, and uh, to that, I want to add the, the fact that the NSA is exempt from auditing by the U.S. government, by law. Oh. Uh, there is no auditing <clears throat> of NSA. Uh, I, I heard some criticism from somebody if, uh, a while back that, I, that that was wrong, that the, uh, the IG did some investigation. Yes, he did some. He investigated Trailblazer. That's one program out of 2,000 programs they have running. He can do a finite amount, but I was talking about auditing all of NSA, how they spend their entire budget. There's no auditing at all. Basically what it is is the government hands them 10 to $15 billion a year and say, here, here, spend it any way you need or want to. Um, it just protect us. Wouldn't you like to have a job like that? I mean, you could take a million or two home a day and they, you know, it'd still be plenty left. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, th this is, uh, and even the chief financial officers at NSA, last two that I knew in the late 90s, early 2000s, said 
NSA could not be audited because of the messy records they keep. <laughs> On, I was going to the privacy act, the, <laughs> uh-huh. the thing about being terrified. I speak in front of a lot of people worldwide, but in particular, when I'm in front of young, the millennials, and even high school students, pre-millennials, or post-millennials, <laughs> I've run a privacy exercise in which I actually make this very, very personal. And it basically says, if, if this matters, if privacy and liberty, which is really the basis of our real security, privacy and liberty, and freedom to speak, that's the fundamental base of who we are as human beings worldwide. If that matters, then why not give up all of your keys? Why not give up all of your passwords? Why not give the government full access to all of your accounts, right? Because ostensibly this is to, for safekeeping. And every time I asked, I run this exercise and ask that question in various ways, with the exception of one person who is being cute in California said maybe, everybody <laughs> has said no, that they would not do that. And when, that's when the real discussion begins because that's what's at stake. It's who we are is at stake. But it also gives me hope because I'll, I had one of my colleagues who actually said, well, what does it mean to me, Tom? When I turn the shades in my apartment, met him literally and figuratively, that's where privacy starts for me. That's a choice. No one can take that away from me. Not in the infrared spectrum. No. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I'm trying not to be a cynic here. <laughs> I think we want to thank the panel. <laughs> Who does the bell toll for, right? It tolls for me. That's right. Thank you, everyone.